This is uh, the Dawn of Everything Book Circle, Chapter Two meeting, uh, Tuesday meeting, uh, one of two, on April 26, 2022. Uh, welcome all. So, Wendy, you were saying um, reading more than one book at a time. Yeah. So, um, I know Tyson's book is sort of floating out there as a another thinking entity, and um, I'm reading quite a lot on um, taking on um, I guess indigenous thinking in lots of different ways, you know, how to think like an animal, um, these two books, if you like. That one, Abraham's book, The Spell of the Sensuous. Oh. I, haven't, I haven't got onto this one, The Coming Animal, but they fit in really well um, with, a, I guess, continuous culture as um, a black drop to reading a book which is about a retrospective on what we could know about culture from or, or a civilization from the past. So there's got to be something useful, I think, in having this um, other perspective that's not just the critique within a book, but critique between books. So that's putting a big rock in the pool, perhaps. <laughs> I know we're talking chapter two, so I've been reviewing that today as well. And um, I just come to it with new ideas. A little bit, I guess, like um, Hank, your introduction, saying that you're looking at these multiple perspectives at once in a, um, in a channel um, where, you know, you've got very qualified people looking at something, but from completely different starting points. And making that conversation because assuming that you know and i have no reason to believe anything but that um the davids when they wrote dawn of everything um took in lots of perspectives there are perspectives outside that they could not have taken in yep. because they weren't those people i wonder if everybody had a chance to look over the reviews that i posted in the um oh yes thank I you the, yeah i thought that second review was very well done of, you know, here's the stuff that they missed that they did not take into account or that they mentioned but didn't really take seriously. And um, you know, Did you see yeah. my answer to that, by the way? <laughs> I haven't, actually. I'm sorry, Mark Antoine. I need, I'm, I, maybe I didn't get a, a, a jiggle that you'd, you'd pinged that on that, so I'll have to go back and look. Um, I, okay, the, 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 there's the, should we get into the meat of that? Because it's really interesting. <laughs> I, I would, if, if you could hold, um, I would like to go over some kind of administrivia stuff. Um, uh, and I don't want to take too much time on it, but I also kind of want to get us all together a little bit. So hang on, let me share my screen. And today I'm trying an experiment. Well, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. Um, I really liked uh, how well both both chapter one meetings did a great job taking notes on Google Docs. Um, Google Docs is a little bit of a pain to get back into the uh, into the website, and so I was hoping we could switch over to uh, HackMD. And so um, let me actually let me share more of my screen, maybe. Uh, so, to to me, I HackMD. Uh, so when I when I uh, share a link, uh, there's a link in in chat to this, um, and I'm going to copy it and paste it again. Uh, when I share a link like this, uh, I've I've set it up so anyone can write, and uh, so let me kind of show you what this might look like if you go to it and you're not logged in. Real quick. Wow, that was cool. Um, I think. <laughs> I don't know what I did. Uh, I hit a hotkey or something that did something that's weird. I love Change what tech geniuses keyboard, out, maybe? Yeah. I love what tech geniuses outsmart themselves. Or something. So you can see my screen. You just might you can't see me. So I'll keep going with that. Is, is that right? Yeah, you're good. Um, Correct. Uh, and then I can fix that a little bit more offline. So um, what I wanted to do, now I'm scared to hit the, the hotkey again. Uh, 
pasting that link in. So when you come to um, a HackMD, you might see it like this. This is kind of the, the web view, uh, you know, the web, web page view of it. Um, you can click this edit button here. And then it's kind of trying to tempt you to sign in, but you don't, you can just ignore that. You don't have to sign in. Um, just ignore that. And then over here are uh, view controls. You can have this um, all marked down or marked down in HTML or just HTML. Um, the just HTML one works really well, by the way. Uh, Judy found out that she could have this view on, on her iPad, I think. And then she had the other view uh, to edit. And that worked really well for her because she could kind of see everything and do stuff. So um, uh, if it's OK, I'll share my screen maybe a, a little bit uh, in this view. And pretty much all you have to do is uh, uh, under notes from this meeting, you can just type stuff and typing stuff is uh, just just regular old text uh, is um, is fine in markdown. And if you want to make a bullet list, you can just use a dash um, uh, like this. And that's kind of all you need to know for now. Um, so multiple people can be typing in the same place at the same time. It's kind of like Google Docs, except you didn't have to log in. And um, this will be a lot easier to turn into a website. Uh, so um, uh, for the folks who know Markdown a little bit, uh, I, I did a fancy. So ignore this if it's confusing and don't if, you, if it's not confusing. Um, this is a, a little bit of an uh, a little in, advanced uh, Markdown thing for check, uh, check, mark, check marks. So this made a checkbox list over here. So I'm going to click off using TACMD. Um, so then I want to talk about big questions, Centac poll and Wikipedia. Um, if you go to the website, uh, which this link I think is at the top of the Mattermost channel. Um, I hope it's also kind of easy to remember dawn of everything dot Um, uh, I made a new page or, or have been kind of threatening to make this page for a while and finally got, got to it. Um, a page of big questions. So these are kind of collected from the conversations that we've had so far. Um, and uh, especially thanks, Ken, for collating these out of, uh, out of the book itself. But there are some really interesting things in here that have kind of come up in conversation. And uh, the, the way to capture these, um, it, it helped a lot uh, that I typed big question, uh, all caps in notes, um, and then, you know, uh, a, a question that had come up. So I think uh, for me, this, you know, that if, if we have anything, I, we'll have a, a nice website, I think, after the book, after we get done with the book. But this, to me, kind of seems like the core of it. Uh, for this particular book, it's about questions and questioning and you know whether or not you rely on answers and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about the big questions page. I wanted to point out that um, I've got a link at the top here. You can click on this um, and you can edit it as a HackMD document. So again, if you click that edit thing, um, you can edit this page and uh, process wise, um, I'm going to come in. Uh, your changes will change on the HackMD page. They won't change on the website until I push a button somewhere. Um, and I'll push that button once or uh, once once a day, maybe once every other day, something like that. Um, or if you ping me in uh, Mattermost, um, then I can, I can do it. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little bit clunky and and like that, but um, uh, it's still pretty good. Uh, I, I encourage you to read through this, add stuff, add some, I don't know, maybe answers or different kinds of sections here. Right now I've got reflections. Uh, this is a reflection from Jordan um, that kind of came out of the conversation. Um, and then, you know, as you find them in the book uh, or in, in reviews or something like that, it would be awesome to start collecting them here too. So I encourage you to Again, the way to get to that, um, the way to get to that, you go to the Dawn of Everything book circle. And if you click here or home, you get to home. And then in contents, there's big questions. And then you can click there. 
that all seems a little bit more complicated than I wish it was, but say la vie. V. Huh? <laughs> it's an old joke from, there was a, a, a group of comedian street performers in Boston and they'd always say c'est la vie and everybody in their car go la vie. So it's just, a, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, my, my oldest daughter did that <clears throat> um, when she was four or something like that. C'est la vie. La vie. Why did I say la vie? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you, you mentioned something important here i think that that might have slipped by people uh, it i pricked my ears up and you said ping me and mattermost what is the best way to get a hold of you if we want you is it mattermost is it email do we text you what's the fastest if we need you to mattermost is one of the best ways okay um a, a more absolute way is to sms me yeah okay um and everything that pressing, but it's nice to know that, you know, because some people don't respond to email for a couple of days and people are going, why are you so slow? And it's like, I don't check email. So I just, I've learned this recently to ask what's the best way to get hold of you if we need you. It's so. a good question. Thanks. Um, email works pretty well too. Uh, okay. So I'm going to check that one off. Um, hey, you, Pete, yeah? can I ask you a question first about that? Please. Yeah. So the web, the website and the hack and D's, in your mind, can you help me understand how what the difference is and what we're curating in the website together versus what's happening on Mattermost? And when things should migrate from Mattermost to the web page? Um, yes. Uh, and I'm going to do that in diagrams. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so there's the website and there's Mattermost and one more. Wendy, did you have one more thing in that? HackMD? Yeah. Mm. HackMD. Um, so, uh, zoom chat, yeah, mm. meet space. <laughs> <laughs> Should I put meet space or, cause I know some of you are, are close enough. You can actually do that. Um, you know, there's other boxes too, like obsidian and, and, uh, and GitHub and I could kind of keep going for a while. Um, can you do me a favor? Just make that window bigger so we can actually see it a little bit better. Yeah, the window bigger or zoom it yeah, more. Yeah, that, that window bigger. Yes, just that helps a little bit. And I could probably zoom it a little bit more too. Um, Thank you. So there's also GitHub and, you know, I'm going to put another one down here. And <laughs> I don't know if we want to talk about it today, but uh, hypothesis. I can mention it briefly since it's on the picture. So um, now I totally lost the website. Or did I, I covered it, right? Yeah. Um, so the way I see it, uh, six months from now, our, our, our club goes um, through September. Um, and at that point, we will have covered the whole book and theoretically we'll kind of wrap up. Um, I, I would like us to leave behind the website. Um, uh, uh, hang on, I just realized that this is, mm. you know, actually, this is two separate things. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> It makes it obvious why we don't interact cleanly when we have this number of places that the interactions happen. <laughs> now, we, now, we need, now we need the Just dawn to state the obvious, game. they're all spawning. Yeah. The dawn of everything mapping channel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's a good one, Michael. 
<laughs> like really, really good. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> did it? Did it, I tell you how this is connected to the Meta Project? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so at you know, in end of September, October, um, I think we'll have a website. So that's this website that we'll be able to leave behind for, kind of forever. And it'll have uh, all of our meetings. Um, and then for each meeting, it's got links out to YouTube and it's got a link to the transcript and the Zoom chat and then the meeting notes that we're taking in Google Docs or HackMD. So that's kind of, um, that's maybe the, that's the non-composted level, level. This is the, the raw material. Um, we're going to continue to grow. Um, Bill and I are working on the wiki at least, and and maybe some of the others of us will too. Uh, but you know, we we're collecting uh, names of people and um, and starting a little bit about each of those people uh, on this uh, on this website. And so this whole thing is going to be a, um, a hopefully rich kind of um uh repository of our conversations and the stuff around the, our conversations um i would love to get into the point where we're also not just having meetings but we're actually having reflections on some of the meetings or reflections over a series of meetings mm -hmm. um so big questions is already that kind of you know it's it's a very small um start on it but it's it's a, the start of us composting um, the raw material from the meetings into a, a more rich um, uh, soil. I, so I think, yeah, the, uh, the composting and reflections on the composting are also a valid um, takeoff point as well. And, and the nature of the numbers of people in the, and how we're meeting should mm -hmm. fit into that because I think there's a lot to be taken not just away from the content but about the process yep so um so then so the the website is kind of the the central you know everything everything should kind of flow towards there uh because uh we have recordings uh another repository will be youtube probably for a long time so I don't know if it's worth junking this up. I could draw lines and I'll, I'll finish this diagram off. I don't have to do it live, but uh, you can see just from what I did that uh, HackMD or Google Docs um, meeting notes ended up, uh, end up on the website. Zoom transcripts end up on the website. Zoom recordings end up in YouTube with a link from the website. Uh, I would hope that conversations in Mattermost, so I guess Mattermost is kind of two things. Um, it's kind of in the moment. Um, uh, uh, coordination stuff. Um, but then there's also like uh, rich discussions or something like that. When when there's an interesting discussion that has taken, it's kind of like a discussion that could have taken place in Zoom or it could have taken place in MeetSpace. Um, uh, uh, those, um, yeah, it's not worth playing around with lines right now. Um, these things happen in Mattermost and the rich discussions should end up in the website as well. Mm um zoom chat ends up in the website so then there's some back end stuff uh github and obsidian um uh and kind of even youtube is plumbing that helps us run the website uh hackmd uh we can use it for meeting notes and then also with this big questions thing i did a, a different kind of use of it which is to use it as a editable page on the on the website, uh, the pages themselves aren't aren't kind of super editable on the website. Um, 
You could also do a derivative of the website down the track, like a simplified version of it, potentially. Yeah, yeah, um, that's, a, uh, that's a good observation. I like that one. So uh, probably, probably nobody here has seen it, but um, Mark Trexler and I work on what he calls microsites, uh, which takes his multi hundred thousand um, the brain version of climate science and distills it down to, you know, an eight page or 10 page little micro website. Um, mm. So we could do the same thing with our, our website. Um, we could fold it. Uh, this is not the website. Uh, we could fold it into, you know, a, like a, a poster session at, at university or something like that, uh, uh, or, you know, a, a PowerPoint or something. Um, so we could kind of encapsulate all of this into, you know, an eight, eight slide presentation or a poster or um, a PDF or, you know, something like that. Here's, you know, here's a rich overview of Donna of everything and, and a bunch of people working to compost it. Um, does that, does that answer your question, Wendy? And Um, more than I needed for the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Aren't you I glad like, you asked? <laughs> you know, I like mapping and flows. So I actually found it really, really <laughs> helpful in general. And I still think there's probably a bit of a question about, you know, it sounds like if conversations start and matter most and then become a rich thread, that that that's kind of the trigger for for it to be considered maybe its own page or to become part of the website. So that the website is the harvesting of all these other um, yep. all these other repositories, right? Of what and so in the end we're saying this is what we've curated from all this time together. Rather than the website being the holding space for all the information, we have all the information in other spaces. The website becomes the holding space for the curation, the sense making, the some of the answers we found or some of the leading questions we still have that remain after after we're done. The, the website ends up hosting most of it and, and it's the stuff that it doesn't fit, um, that it doesn't host, but yes, the website is where we harvest things and it's the rich thing. Um, I, since we're taking a little bit of extra time on this and, and I want to make sure that we talk about chapter two, but I wanted to show one more thing. Um, there's a, a cool plugin called Hypothesis uh, and this works on any, any website. Um, actually, let me find a Wikipedia page. And I wonder if, I guess, I guess I, I guessed bad. Um, hypothesis is a little sidebar that you can pop up on any website, uh, and then it'll show anybody who has a hypothesis can view the annotations to the, the web page, and anybody can add annotations. And so this, the Don of Everything Book Circle homepage is annotated. I highlighted this and made a, um, a comment that uh, I've, I've got a commitment to um, fold in things that people add via hypothesis into the, the wiki itself. So that's some another way, yet another way, <laughs> yet another box. <laughs> um, uh, another way to, to uh, uh, contribute to this page, uh, you could highlight stuff and, um, and you know, add an annotation or <clears throat> is there a group or is there a, it would be nice to have a common hypothesis group so we can annotate other stuff and it would be visible to the group um i i i'm a hypothesis newbie and i don't know about groups okay uh you can create a group and then explicitly add hypothesis users and then annotations you can list all the annotations yep. in that group Yep. Uh, that were made against awesome. that group. It's not just everybody yep. in the group. It's you've made that annotation against that group. So we could make a DOE group and then we could say this goes there and then make that visible. And, and then if I'm understanding correctly, 
and we would you would also end up with a view from different websites right so we could yes. go to a website that's a book review about dawn of everything um, exactly. or sound talk like or the the, the the ken's uh, ken's criticism like i could make hypothesis things yeah uh, of ken's and we could add them yep i will set up a doe hypothesis group thanks mark antoine Pleasure. um Uh, okay, so let's, next two topics should be real quick. Uh, maybe you've seen it, uh, I think, yeah, in uh, the Don of Everything Metamos channel. Um, Ken had the interesting suggestion that, hey, we could just do kind of the same thing uh, for Sand Talk right now, um, because Ken happens to be reading Sand Talk. <laughs> um, and uh, to be fair, it also comes up a lot in our conversations around Don of Everything. Um, so there's a poll in Mattermost, um, and this, you don't have to have contributed to the poll. Um, uh, but I wanted to suggest that maybe you want to. So we've got six votes, uh, four is yes, starting soon. Uh, two people are, are, yeah, I'd be interested, but I don't want to do it uh, concurrently with uh, Dawn of Everything. Um, I'd have to say from this poll, it's looking like maybe we should get, get one started. Um, and let's discuss that more on Mattermost, I think. So then the last thing also, probably you've seen this somewhere, um, Tyson, Yonkaporta, and Sa Santok, neither one of them has a Wikipedia page. And so there are a few of us who are going to be doing uh, building Wikipedia pages. Uh, so just today, I started a new Wikipedia channel and um, feel free to join this channel and, and um, we'll have an expedition uh, mid-May probably. Uh, Wikipedia oh, is- Oh, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wikipedia is a bit of a beast and I, I, haven't, I haven't let on that that's the case uh, anywhere, um, but um, editing, creating a Wikipedia page and then making it something that stays there um, is a bit of uh, a bit of a, social, mostly social, uh, and a little bit of technological um, uh, hair raisingness. And so um, it's, it's a fun thing to know about. Um, and it's fun to know why, why and how you build Wikipedia pages. But also, plainly on the face of it, Tyson needs a Wikipedia page and Sandhawk needs a Wikipedia page. So many burns at one, with one stone. Um, thanks. Uh, that took more than I, I thought it would, but um, we covered all kinds of interesting stuff. Uh, and um, I want to make sure that we do a retro at the end of the call. So um, I'll wait in about 15 minutes before the end of the call and let's, let's retro and check out. So with that, uh, let's get back into uh, Marc Antoine, <laughs> if I've not completely blown your stack. Um, you were about to say I, I did other stuff, sorry. I, I, this needed to be said, but I was like, okay, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, but I don't know in terms, sorry, in terms of agenda, are we discussing chapter two? Or are we discussing Ken's criticism, which is a whole thing in itself and could take whatever time is left? Um, I'm good with either one. The, 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 but okay, let, let me then try to. <laughs> Not everybody has read the criticism, so we really should go over it up to a point. But what they're saying essentially is well, one, one thing they're saying many things. But one thing they're saying is one argument throughout Down of Everything is we don't have clear, solid evidence on. Uh, what was the social order at earlier, or and they're against a linear uh, narration of these are the stages of development of social. These are the tales, the stages of social evolution. So they're kind of refusing the notion that there's an initial state because they're refusing the linear storytelling. And here there are people who say, no, no, we have pretty good evidence about an initial state. Uh, so maybe, and, and they're a bit incensed that they deny that uh, the two Davids don't go into 
what is known about initial state. And clearly the initial state, according to these people, is much more egalitarian. Now, assuming this is all true, and I have no reason to doubt it, by the way, uh, I don't think it undermines the basic argument of none of everything, which is even if there is an initial state, there still needn't be a linear evolution of society from initial uh, diversity or initial equality to the current we're locked in hierarchies. Uh, the basic argument of the Davids is we could imagine something different. We, we used to, we always have, no reason not to do it now. That remains, I think, whether or not the initial state was universal uh, or varied or unknowable as the two Davids are claiming. I think that unasking the question of the initial state was just a way for the two Davids to um, unask the question of, of undermining the notion of linear history and saying, you know, we don't need to solve that problem. Now, that problem happens to be solved even better, <laughs> right? Um, but I think that was just not their issue. So I understand why people who have a huge stake in was their initial state are annoyed about this question being unasked by Graeber and uh, Windrow. But I don't think it has huge impact on the basic notion, we can imagine something else, there was diversity. That said, these people, the, criti the critics are making very, very interesting other points, which absolutely are worth diving into. Uh, one is uh, that I found fascinating personally, and there are others, is how uh, there's this huge correlation between hierarchy, uh, like class inequality and gender inequality, and how they seem to have co-evolved. Uh, and that's absolutely worth digging into. And uh, there's something about, I wrote it as uh, class ascending here. And, um, oh yeah, what is the, basically the, the, I would call it class warfare up to a point. Uh, the notion that there has been a strong effort by uh, owning and powerful classes to uh, undermine certain social order, and which I don't think that, again, Graeber would deny at any point, but they do go into the question of the constituent assembly, like what is the, the legitimacy? But anyway, there's, there's a whole chapter on class struggle, which I think is extremely important. And the whole, uh, yeah, the question of materialism, uh, how important are material conditions? And there I must say I'm a bit more uh, close to when we grow the, and, and, and it's uh, material conditions are probably important determinants, but not absolute determinants. And again, Graeber and Wengro try to say it's not the absolute and uh, pro the critics are saying, well, certain material conditions are necessary for the uh, rise of inequality, which may still be true, but it remains true that it's not absolute. But anyway, the critic are worth reading. There's definitely important stuff there. I don't think it undermines the value of the book. That's my short version of the critics, but then we'd have to dig into the details. I don't remember them offhand. Are there big questions in there, Mark Antoine, that you would kind of tons. leave behind? Tons, tons, tons. The, 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 big, the big first question is, what is there such an, a thing as an initial state of human society, right? Uh, Graeber and Wengro unask the question and decide we can't know and we don't care because after that, it's all arbitrary and diverse. And the critics say, yeah, there is one and it matters to the question of how did inequality arise? So that's a big question. I mean, if, if there is indeed a universal egalitarian state, uh, you know, uh, egalitarian initial state, then the question of the evolution of inequality takes a slightly different uh, 
uh, angle than if we're saying there was always diversity or the past is shrouded in mystery. Um, so that's a big question. And I think the other big question that they're asking is how, it's, it's the whole question of material determinism. How much do material means of production and material structures of production encourage? Are they the probably necessary conditions for the rise of inequality? Are they sufficient conditions? Those are really the questions, right? Then you have something to add. Yeah, uh, I was very struck when they were um, recounting some of the old stories of, you know, it, it, there was a time when animals and humans um, communicated and, you know, they could they could shift, shape shift. And this, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, there was a time when we were shifting from being apes to, uh, in, into being humans. And what we know about primate societies is that they're, you know, especially chimpanzees, for example, very Machiavellian, you know, a lot of hierarchy and, and um, uh, politics and stuff. And, and um, somewhere along the line, so it seems to me like the initial stages, and we're going back maybe a million years, because we're talking about three million years here. I don't know, I don't actually know how long this is, but um, yeah, versus bonobos, exactly. That's, you can talk about the bonobo revolution, Tamsin, Willie Barkers, but um, Tamsin's point is that what separates humans from other primates is that we're superorganisms because we actually, um, while we do have that genetic programming to be Machiavellian and political and, and under, underhanded and, and you know always trying to get one up on people, uh, or others, I should say, we also um, uh, have grandmothers that, that live past menopause and help contribute to the raising of children. And we can act in uh, what she calls a superorganism way where we take care of the whole in ways that there, there are no parallels in primate societies to what humans do in terms of um, coming up with civilizations. So there's something that happened and we don't know when and we don't know how. But it seems to be an enormous question hanging in the background of what created that. And that goes directly to this question of what is the origin of inequality? Because if, in my mind, if we're transitioning from being an ape-like society to a human-like society, it probably started out as being very unequal with dominant males. And then somehow or another, that shifted to becoming equal. And now we're on unequal footing. And so maybe it's a dynamic thing that keeps tripping down the generations in evolution. I don't know. I'm, I'm very much in a, a, a big question state here. So I just thought I'd throw that in the background. I do think we've got lots of different models here. If you take um, the root of saying indigenous cultures and particularly continuous ones have um, the ability to view nature um, in a way that we've lost. And so, you know, you, you can talk about, you know, an animistic view where you've got an animal that you can interact with, but that's not the only model. There's lots of models there and many different biological ones. And I think the materiality of that um, and how we record that and how we talk about it as, and how we observe it has got to fit in there somewhere because these are really long interactions that are very, very deep. And they're also informing how people actually survived. You know, if this one worked better than that one in this particular region, but in another region, it was quite different. Now, so there's a materiality that goes behind these interactions about how we record them and how we've um, interrogated them that we've learned from over time. And they're very situated in the context that people are in. You know, if you don't have, if you don't have apes in your context, <laughs> if you have you know, butterflies and insects more in your context, you're observing different systems, different social systems. And how you record them and how you work with that and weave them and, and the epigenetics of all of that, that's a really big um, tapestry to be talking about. Yeah, the, 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 I, I guess the real, not the real, but one of the underlying big questions, I don't know if it's explicitly made, but it's the whole uh, how much of inequality and power is nature versus nurture, right? I mean, and, and, and that means how can it be changed? I'm not a fan of Pinker, but he did say, you know, the, there's a whole current of 
left-wing thought that says, uh, you know, it's all cultural because we're not happy with the idea that uh, power should be ingrained in our gen uh, brain genetics, which I personally believe, I think Pinker is wrong on this, but it's either way we want to know. <laughs> and, and there's certainly been um, a kind of wishful thinking of the left. And again, I include myself here on, we think that uh, inequality is not wired into our brain because we want it to not be wired in our brain. What I actually believe, frankly, is that both equality and inequality mechanisms are there in our brain or otherwise. And what, how these mechanisms become potential actualized uh, from potential to actualized in a given society depends on society history. Again, there are, there is evidence of that, uh, of societies uh, triggering pro-social or uh, egotistic behavior. Uh, and that's why I tend to believe it's not uh, purely um, genetic, or at least if it's genetic, it's everybody's genetic as opposed to, you know, uh, the, the sociobiological nightmare of here are the uh, dominating genes and here are the, <laughs> uh, so they're unequally distributed, then it becomes a way to explain why some societies dominated others. <laughs> but, you know, that's one nightmare scenario. But again, we want to know either way. But certainly that's a big question. How much of this is ingrained and how much of this is something we can change? That's the underlying big question at the base of all those books and all those arguments. So I, I think you stepped into something very important and that is the kind of either or, uh, that it's a mix. And part of the advantage of current uh, intellectual thinking is to be willing to consider several paths simultaneously. And we live in a culture that pushed us to either or, it's either this or it's that. In fact, almost everything is a blend, which means it takes narrative and sensitivity to figure out what's actually going on. Totally, totally, totally agreed. And for me, this is one of the virtues of the Graeber book because by telling the history of diversity of social forms, it's very much showing the actual reality of this blend in human history. I also think, um, listening to their critique of the indigenous, I love this chapter, by the way, the indigenous critique. I just, I just thought this was such a great freaking chapter. I, I've listened to it twice and I'll probably go back and listen again. And, um, you know, the, the fact that so much of our modern thinking is still predicated on Rousseau is amazing to me. It's like, this is one guy cooked up all this shit and it's still just spread all over the place. Like, talk about lack of imagination <laughs> just i'm just making a comment here just it, it just really struck me as why is rousseau so still so you know uh, such a, a huge figure i mean there should be way more um uh lines of thought song lines if you will out there that we should be paying attention to rousseau and Chargo, i think well yeah, and uh, Ter Tergo, I can't pronounce the name, uh, the one who uh, formulated for the first time the, the four steps uh, in humanity's development. Uh, uh, there's a nice point right at the end of the chapter when they're taking stock and uh, they sort of, they're not condemning Rousseau, except that he made his indigenous people a kind of a thought experiment and mm. uh, stripped them of all humanity. But I think thought experiments uh, are really important and they have been important uh, since well before the, the 17th century. But what I really like in, in the whole book and certainly this chapter is the the idea of where some of the source codes of our modern thinking come from. And they come from people like Rousseau, but Tergo even more. And they come from uh, what, uh, what the Davids called 19th century uh, imperialists uh, who sort of made a, 
uh, a dogmatic model for the oppression of uh, people in their the 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 lands they colonized and what i really love in in the whole book and there's a special part in this chapter which just indicates how our thinking got frozen into these uh into these uh, sort of uh, fake paradigms uh, that's not the right word but mm. uh, you know what I mean. So what I really like in this chapter, and, and maybe other people would like to comment on that, is the idea of the enlightenment having actually come about because of the introduction of a very intelligent, perhaps even much more intelligent, non-European thinking. Yeah. And as you may know, I mean, there's there's a lot of chatter in, in Europe and the European Commission and even the United Nations to some extent of what they call uh, Enlightenment 2.0 or 3.0. So then it makes you wonder if it took totally alien for Europeans, if it took totally alien impulses to change the way Europeans thought and understood uh, society, what do we need in the 21st century? And I don't think it's going to be just indigenous thinking, because I'm also reading Sand Talk now, and, and he's very negative about the way uh, uh, non-indigenous people uh look at indigenous wisdom these days but what is there that is so alien to our thinking in so-called western knowledge societies that could spark a totally new way of thinking anyway that, mm. that's what i wanted to put on the table um, so I would um, add to that, and thank you, that's, I think, really, really important, that we're using words and language in ways um, that um, don't necessarily allow us to describe the intersections between different cultures. So, you know, if you, and, and know that I'm sort of privileged at looking in great detail, some of the yarns that Tyson Young Deporters had with Dave Snowden and Indigenous other people in Papua New Guinea and Australia and um, Turtle Island, North America. Um, the words that are used to describe concepts exist in these other languages. The, the, those concepts just don't exist in the language that we're using to exchange our, our thinking about something. And, and if you don't have that language, you don't have and those words actually come from those environments as well they come from those cultures so if you don't have those as your primary ingredient you've got to reach pretty deeply to get those intersections even represented in any way that someone who doesn't come from those cultures would even recognize it's like i i sat very briefly looking at um a blade of grass and a little patch of grass the other day. And I'm thinking, well, this is constructed itself from an environmental point of view. It's it's a piece of my lawn. I wait a long time for an ant to go walking across it because it's not, not a natural environment. And that's that might be the only bit of nature that I, in my life in China, because I've had this conversation with students in my household, they don't have trees in their village. They might not even have grass. They'd be lucky to have a plant. So how can you have organic thoughts when you don't have those things in your immediate environment where you grew up? And so you're you're asking people to to reach really deeply to bring in concepts that they can't have in their day to day life because they don't have, you know, the trees and the grass and the animals and the insects and such all interacting around you. You don't have a model. Your language doesn't even remotely reference it. So you've got a long way before you can actually take something that happened in the past, that that that's where those languages came from. Before you can have a turtle rattle, you've got to have turtles, <laughs> you know? And, and I do, I can't say it, it shish, 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 help me. Anyway, a turtle rattle is important in Canadian um, culture, in, in um, Melanie Goodchild's world. 
it's it's what her mission is. She takes that around with her to remind her of her country. But if you don't have turtles, and a turtle rattle is something that you can't even talk and think about, how do you get to that point where you can say, this is my thing that I carry around, that's my mission in the world? It's like, wow, how long, how many exchanges do you need to have to even get to that starting point? How do you exchange from another world without going through another language? Pete, you know, your, your point that you made about Wikipedia and how you could have everybody having their own pages and talking about things in their own languages versus everyone doing it in English or French or German. How much do we lose by having those filters at the beginning and even turning it into language? You lose an awful lot of the richness of things over time and the materiality of where those words came from is really, um, it's the root of language, you know, the, the birds and the things you were around are where those words came from. So we're so distant from the environment that these ideas even came from and the ways that we can describe them. So end of rant, but I think it's really important. Language is huge and it's turning up in these yarns. It seems that this depository of, of thoughts and, and ways to understand the world is best expressed in religions. Um, because religions form the filters through which we understand the reality around us. And then it was becoming really obvious when the Europeans started to venture out into the world and encountered different cultures who had developed belief systems that guided their actions in completely different ways. I mean, the Chinese, for example, invented gunpowder long before the Europeans did, but they never used it for war because they thought it was just way too poodle and too destructive to be used in warfare. Whereas the European mindset was, oh, we got a new toy, you know, and, and uh, let's, let's, uh, let's use that uh, to, to uh, become more potent in warfare. So, so what, what was the European mindset you now that, that, that was so different from other cultures who couldn't fathom to create so much violence and destruction. So, so I, I think understanding the, the belief systems um, they, dating all the way back uh, into you know, the oldest recorded uh, uh, scriptures really helps to understand why, why peoples you know, act and react in the ways they do and, and claim, you know, uh, claim the right to take over this land or to annihilate these people or to, to, to take dominion uh, over, over other cultures. Um, so, so the, the, uh, the, and, and, and when we look at the intellectual capacity, for ex, particularly here in the first chapter, you know, where the Americans were intellectually the equals, culturally the equals of, of Europeans, in some ways even superior, but they didn't translate that into tool making. And I think one, one um, um, phenomena is that some cultures engage in tool making and in, in, in uh, advancing um, their the, the, the means of, of building you know, the, uh, the physical structures, building uh, weapons of war, um, just has been, has been uh, guided differently. You know, so, so it's, it's, it's that innate understanding of how the world is organized that was expressed in religions, complete mythology you know, that, that empowered uh, people to do things. I, you know, so anyway, I'll leave it there. Um, I'm just going to say with regard to language, I had a Huna teacher who said, you know, if you have a word for it, you have a, you have a concept, right? And, um, but I, I was thinking when I was on Bali, um, you know, Bali as an island is just filled with beauty that's, that's human created. And yet they have no word for art. It doesn't occur to them to name what they do as art. So that's an interesting little paradoxical way of, of being in the world. And 
Um, I'm not sure, of course, that it comes down to religions. I, mean, I think a lot of indigenous peoples don't really have religion as we would recognize it in the West. Some do, but I, I think there's also a lot of other ways of approaching things. So certainly religion is a major um, interpretive filter for the world, but it tends in, in the West to be, um, especially these days, monotheic, monotheistic. And you know, if you look at um, uh, before the rise of monotheism, uh, there's a lot of indigenous cultures that do indeed have a creator God, but they never propitiate that creator God unless they're at the end of their complete rope. Because they're like, that God has moved on. He's creating the rest of the universe. We need to pray to the local gods. We need to, we need to talk to the trees. We need to talk to the rocks, you know? And in that sense, there was a sense of sacredness about the land being alive and other things being alive that we often do not ascribe in, in Western civilization. But there wasn't a worship per se. And I think that's a really big difference in the religion. So it's, that's a whole huge conversation to have, but I just wanted to throw that, that alternate uh, view in there because I, I think religion can get us into a lot of trouble if, if that's the only lens we're looking through. And, you know, so I'll just, I'll leave it there. Yeah, build, building on that and, and, and also what uh, Klaus and Wendy said uh, before, a lot has to do with worldview. Uh, the Davids are, are, are very clear uh, about their view of that. They, they said towards the end of the chapter, uh, one of the reasons that we are still uh, uh, under the spell of this uh, false paradigm is that Rousseau was able to explain it in a way that 18th century French intellectuals and salon goers could understand it. And then the intellectuals were too lazy to actually think it through. And he says in another part of the chapter, I have it here on page 66, uh, there's really only one major difference uh, between the way Rousseau thought about these things and the way Kandiaronk, uh, uh, the Euron, uh, the Wendat thought about it, was that uh, uh, Kondiaric could visualize both worldviews, his own peoples and the European, whereas Rousseau cannot really envisage society being based on anything else than the way Europeans think. And I think that's a very telling point is uh, uh, the, the context of the culture you're thinking of. And obviously the, uh, the, the, the forest people of, of North America, the, the, the first Americans had a much broader context than even the French philosophers and, and Salon conversationalists. So I just threw something in the chat. One of the things that really struck me was, and I don't know, because I'm listening, I don't know how to spell the guy's name, but Condi Aronk, um talked about money. Why would I ever touch money? I mean, if you gave it to me, why wouldn't I give it to the first person I see is starving, yeah. you know? And um, so I'm just curious what other people thought about that, because I found myself going, I can now see why Graber's an anarchist, and I'm starting to drift into the anarchy camp here <laughs> reading this, this book, you know? like. Yeah. <laughs> Are we good pals now, Mark Antoine? <laughs> <laughs> I'm. Um, I, I find it very interesting the question of anarchy. I mean, that's the that's one big question. Where do I stand in anarchy? I mean, a big part of me is very attracted to anything that gets us away from power and domination. On the other hand, another part of me is. Uh, well, we want to avoid the kind of uh, environmental damage. That means regulations. Uh, and that means taking this is the, uh, collective action and collective action means collective decision. The one thing that was really fascinating overall in the uh, Dawn of Everything book is how he says, you know, it's really important that there's a margin so that you can have a group deciding collectively we're doing this and people who don't want it have an elsewhere to go. So they don't have to sabotage if they disagree, they can just go elsewhere and do their own thing. Of course, if their own thing, and this is where you got into the, it's like the limits, how do you tolerate intolerance? 
if this other thing is conquering people and forcing them to do your will, <laughs> you're in trouble. Uh, but but certainly the and or, or if the other thing is, for example, we have all the debate now about geoengineering. I think geoengineering is a very bad idea. Some people have the means to just do it. And so this calls for the question of enforcement. So my the contrast between my idea of we need enforcement against you know dangerous single person's action. Of course, they're dangerous because they have so much power. So and they got so much power because of accumulation and of power in the first place. So the prob the basic problem is still power, but the the uh, need for collective action versus the need for avoiding power accumulation. I haven't solved the anarchy versus regulation conundrum for myself. It's, it's a complex problem. Uh, certainly what I'm working for is enabling better consensus making so that we can have the best of both worlds, but that's idealistic. There will always be people disagreeing and there'll always be people in a uh, I passed around a totally unrelated article on uh, in another circle about the uh, mistake versus conflict theory. People who think that the main problem is people are making other people are making mistakes, and if they knew better or understood better, we'd agree. <laughs> and people who think in conflict terms are saying, you know. These people are enemies and we need to have power over them. And, and, and that what was really interesting is both the extreme right and extreme left are thinking purely in terms of conflict, whether it's class conflict or race conflict, but it's conflict. Whereas the middle thinks in terms of better systems and how can we fix the mistakes? Uh, and again, this is from an anarchy versus uh, Regulation. Regulation is totally within the uh, theory of mistakes framework. And again, probably both apply. <laughs> uh, there, there is such a thing as conflict and there is such a thing as mistakes and we need to address both causes of disagreement if we are to, for the greater good, whether the greater good is uh, agreed upon regulation or possibility of dissent, both are probably necessary again. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, I guess I'm a pluralist on the question of anarchism also. It's, it's, those are big questions. <laughs> Just on, on a more, more mundane note, I, I really was struck by the way the that um, Condi Oranc's conversations with um, is it La, La Hongan, I'm forgetting its name. Uh, La Hongan. La Hongan. Uh, was were. I, I was very curious to know whether. Um, the arguments of Dantin to Condi Ronk that the Davids presented were his best because they really seemed so weak. You know, like the way that Condi Ronk's wisdom in saying, you know, if, if your defense of European society is that, oh, if we blew this up, then, you know, the upper classes would suffer, which I can't imagine as a rational person's best defense of the existing society in Europe. It, you know, it made me wonder whether the Davids were leaving out better arguments that were made or whether in fact, as they, um, as they said, the um, European excuse for uh, Condi Aranc's superior argument was that he was set up as a way for, um, for an argument that was untenable to be made by a European to be made 
I don't know if I'm being clear, but you, you, you know, the, the pre pre presenting a weak argument as right. a straw man, it was a known tactic at the time very much. Right. You could sure. pretend, pre pretend to make a false argument to sure. defend yourself against because the king could totally behead you. So right. you make you make the weak argument and I right. made this argument. <laughs> and, and, that's what, and that's what the Davids were saying, you know, everybody has always assumed that's, that's what Adaria was, and that's what these other examples that they cite of the sort of, you know, noble savage in plays and fictions, um, you know, that this really wasn't uh, an argument born of American indigenous outlook on, on, on European Moors, uh, Moors, but, um, yeah, I, I just I just wonder if if this is attributable to a weak argument, you know, to truly a weak argument against Condi Ronk as presented in the book, or whether the Davids are are so intent on having Condi Ronk's you know position be clearly superior that they're not presenting the best of what was responded in in that book which you know i'm not reading of course i'm rel relying on their account of it. i have a friend who actually knows that era very well i could ask the question uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. but i doubt like i'm sure there were weak arguments in laota again by design because that's a way for, for Laotin to present a controversial idea and avoid pushback. Um, I'm also sure that there are arguments, and I'm sure there's more arguments than what we saw because I'm sure there were many, but I, I, I remember an argument I heard about for against uh, the democracy in those days that makes no sense to us. Uh, and it's the kind of argument that if I were the Davids, I would not repeat because it's so obviously nonsensical to us, but it made sense to them at the time. It was about if you do vote, you're kind of biasing against the dead. The dead should have a voice and would have, of course, preferred whatever was there in their time. So there's a conservative bias of the dead that you're uh, disregarding unjustly by doing a vote with only the people alive. For us, that's obviously absurd. But in the, in the time, this was a rational argument to make. The Greek historian Polybius has a thought that's helpful here. He says that the shift from autocracy to democracy to tyranny and back through the cycle depends upon circumstances and that the problems that a society faces, for example, internal distribution are best handled by democracy. But if you have external conflicts that are threatening the state, democracy is terrible because it leads to factions and divides the energy. So the idea that the form of the government fits the conditions under which people are living seems to me like a very rational idea. And one of the things you get in the Graeber is, for example, how the political structure can shift with the seasons. Uh, so it can be hierarchical in winter when everybody's living together. And then the spring comes and everybody separates out into small groups that are much more egalitarian. I think it's quite beautiful. Quickly, before Klaus goes, this was explicitly done in the Roman Republic. When that's before it was an empire, the Roman had Senate chambers and pol political assembly. It was an elite political assembly, but it was a political assembly. But when there was an external enemy, you name a tyrant, a, 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 gener a temporary ruler to take care of the military emergency. And that person gets deposed after that. And that's perfectly, and it was done. Sorry, Klaus. Yeah, I came across this paper for, by uh, Sorokin, Culture in Crisis, you know, the visionary theories here. And what the guy is arguing is that um, uh, cultures swing back and forth between, similar to what Doug was just saying, between a sensate materialistic culture 
and then an ideational and spiritual culture and very much driven by circumstances and, and, and uh, realities that are imposed onto the culture, whether that's you know, running out of uh, uh, supplies, running out of food, money, getting into wars and so on. Uh, and then there is a third form, which is the integral idealistic culture, uh, which combines both together. Uh, and so he's arguing that Western cultural history has been, engaged, has been a sensate materialistic culture um, for quite some time and, and probably got, uh, gotten us through the entire era of European expansion you know, into dominating indigenous cultures around the world. I mean, from South America, North America, India, uh, Asia, you know, China, when you think about it. Um, but he is arguing that the, the transition from one form to another is typically, uh, is typically turning into a crisis, typically that uh, it is marked by conflict, by wars, uh, and, and, uh, and power shifts that are, uh, that are precipitating aggression you now between, between power blocks. So, it, I mean, this has been written quite a while ago. There's obviously no, no real discernible timeline here, but it does seem to make sense. It does seem to, uh, to shift in, in, in ways that the cultural revolution was also maybe not precipitated, but accompanied by the Reformation, right? I mean, the Reformation was a, a, a very drastic shift in mindsets in the European culture, um, where the biblical story was being turned you know, into what is the true idea and purpose of the New Testament, what is uh, going back to you know, the principles of that uh, level of teaching. So uh, I, I, I can see that you know, the, 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 we are in a crisis of transition uh, where we are shifting our mindsets uh, into, into forms that challenge existing power structures and precipitate conflict. like this group, it's a lot slower than last week. So my question to this group, because we're going to be summarizing all of this pretty soon, is if we need our environment to create a context for us to practice power shifts in a way that isn't destructive. How can we create that sort of context for learning how to have different forms of power? It seems to me that we're jumping, you know, Ukraine is an example. You know, somebody wanted something. <laughs> um, and so now, there's a big shift locally because somebody wanted something and they could reach out with power to get it. And someone fought back. Um, and that, that was, a, I guess, a form of seasonality of shift. Um, you can see patterns in the locality. But there's lots of little versions of that, that people don't seem to be able to learn from. It's not war, but it's a localized version of that. Um, I feel that we need to practice all of this stuff before it gets to a critical point. So we've got other ways of arranging our behaviors. Now that we can play on such big grand scales and the Davids do actually make that point. A lot of people make that point. You know, now we can play at very big scales, our little skirmishes. <laughs> in a family, in a locality, around resources. Um, we can pretend that they don't scale, but they sort of do when somebody can push a big button somewhere. I feel like 
I'm not definitely not an expert in this field in any way. And there's a lot more people in this Zoom room that have a lot more to say, but it's what's coming up for me is a question around that comes from the chapter two about the nature of discourse in providing the environment, right? It's not looking for a particular outcome. It's mm. not assuming that the power structure, there's one power structure in the room and they'll politely listen to everybody else. And then the power, per the person in power will make the decision and everybody goes on the merry way and has to deal with it. It's, it's assuming that conversation will continue until uh, an agreed upon answer is reached and, and that it's not even like there's an end point assumed that we, the, the conversation continues every single day. And every single day we come to little decisions along the way. And that gently shifts. It's not one, again, it's not something swooping in, which mm. ends up looking like a crisis in the, and the, from the outside in, Oh, some crisis precipitated a change, um, which, which I think we land on because our systems aren't flexible enough to adjust for all this, or that for any message, any softer messages that come at the system right now are forced to scream, yell, cry, you know, argue or create war in order for something to change. And I'm going extreme here, but I'm just saying like that I really liked the concept around if there was constant discourse and constant argument around where should we go next and what's emerging for our community and where do we want to take that and what decision does that make for all peoples at all levels and that conversation continued on and was automatically assumed would include the voices from all the people at all the level i mean it's just a completely different way of looking at it and i think um in in its best form which I don't, i'm not sure was always presented in indigenous cultures but lots of them did have a really good form of it, it seems like from the book, way the book presented it that um would would help a lot towards making these shifts over long period longer periods of time and more gracefully one of the things i was struck by sorry mark i'm trying to go ahead sorry Put your hand up uh, Adam. Just <laughs> just quickly, I drew, uh, a book was just uh, brought to my attention. It's called The Quiet Before on the Unexpected Origin of Radical Ideas. And it's about precisely this whole how ideas arise in conversations. And uh, he gives a lot of political examples of how, you know, all the shift in discourse before the revolution happens. So the slow buildup. Uh, so you were speaking about the slow, not necessarily ending versus the cut. This is about the progression of the slow before the cut. So I'll put the, that's it. Pete, did you want to go? Uh, I wanted to head us towards wrapping up. So uh, you should go, Ken. All right. I'm just going to quickly say, uh, I threw a couple of, I, I have a whole bunch of things bookmark that I have to transcribe into into quotes, which I will do to put into the HackMD notes. But um, one of those was about the idea of um, baseline communism uh, from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. And he gives the example of, you know, if if someone's asking for some help and it's easy to do, like they're drowning and all you have to do is swim a rope, any decent person would, would do that. And that the woodland societies of North America at the time uh, that the Europeans were arriving here, they guaranteed an autonomous life to everybody. Now the women owned and worked the land, but, but freely distributed the, the fruits and the men went out and did the hunting and freely distributed the, the, the you know, the harvest from the, from the hunts as well. And it seems to me that the question about social inequality really goes to the heart of so many of our problems. You know, um, is there a group that is more deserving than others? And if so, that means there's groups that aren't deserving. And so they can be laying on the street in their own vomit, you know, and excrement. And you can walk right by them and say, I don't have anything to do with that. That's not part of me, you know, but I personally have a very um, strong and negative reaction to that. And um, I'm really curious of, you know, what would it take? And this goes to the heart of clauses, uh, point about religion because a lot of religions say we're the ones you know those other people the infidels you know they don't deserve to live so that's a very dangerous meta narrative that um, those other people aren't deserving and it seems to me if we're going to get through the next 
100 years and be a species uh, 100 years or 1,000 or 10,000 or 50,000 years from now, we really have to come to grips with um, who gets the chance to live, who gets what they need in order to be taken care of. And uh, the, the walls are closing in, you know, we're headed for, I'm looking at Hank, the Hank's background, the eye needle there, you know, we're, we're coming up on that. And how can we bring as many people through that eye needle as possible? So when we come out the other side, they have the, the necessary um, elements to live a dignified life that um, allows them to make a contribution instead of being so marginalized that they're always, you know, uh, at risk of being genocided. Um, Klaus and Hank, you should go. Klaus first. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that Jerry made uh, a comment when he talked about trust. Uh, he, he published uh, um, a response somewhere, and, and, and in that response, he linked to um, a, a small video that he was shooting about the need to trust. And he made a really cute comment in there where he was saying, you know, I'm, I'm looking at science, I'm reading science fiction. So my desire to be one of the first to go into outer space is rather small because when you read science fiction, we have the same um, raw um, emotions and conflicts and fights that we have here on Earth. So why would I go out into outer space under more complicated <laughs> circumstances? Yeah, so, so there is very little uh, optimism, let's put it this way, right? Let me just uh, build on uh, what Ken was saying uh, and the eye of the needle. Uh, that's the whole final discussion in the chapter is that nobody has yet satisfactorily defined what does this question of equal or unequal mean? Does it mean equal opportunity, equal under the law, equal uh, access to whatever, equal, equally free from the threat of whatever? And I think if we're talking about big questions, that's certainly a big question for our discussion since it is the big question in, uh, in this chapter and, and in the book, what what does that actually mean? I mean, we're from uh, many different uh, subcultures of a Western culture here in this call, and we probably share a lot of ideas, but are probably not even, I'm not even sure that we all agree on the same ideas. So that's a big question I think is worth covering. Thanks, Hank. And maybe that's kind of a good place to start to wrap. Um, Let's uh, end on time. And so we'll just do a quick retro, I think. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, share the HackMD at least. Um, I'm just finishing up adding, adding Hank's question to the big question section here. Um, and we, did a, we collected a lot of uh, material from the meeting. So thank you, um, folks. Uh, so um, what went well on this call? There were silences, so that meant that we could sort of reconfigure the direction we were taking, that there was a sort of considered pace. Uh, what else? I like the variety of ideas that came up, and we didn't get to go into depth on all of them, but uh, a, a lot of interesting ideas were were broached and interesting resources given for for uh, looking up in the in the next days uh, and what else i like that we got a chance to talk about the uh criticisms that i posted from uh i don't know who wrote them but two different reviews of the book that gave some criticisms. Yeah. And I, I agree strongly with Marc Antoine that although they're valid criticisms, they don't really detract from the overall thrust of the book. There's still a lot of really good stuff there. And I was found myself much more informed uh, by reading those criticisms, especially the second one. Um, what would we do differently next time?
maybe less uh, a shorter introduction of all the different uh, uh, websites and how they interact with each other and uh, just uh, men give us the links and they seem to be intuitive enough you can sign up and learn how to do them. Um, thanks, Hank. I, I wonder, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not intuitive enough to use. Oh, well, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, uh, illiterate, but I could sign up to hack MD and, and, yep. and hypothesis while we were talking. If I can do it, I think anyone can. <laughs> sorry. No, sorry. I don't know. I, 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 oh, go ahead, Mark. No, sorry. I, I think going in depth on the site structure on the fly, <laughs> this should have been prepared a bit in advance so we could have had a shorter thing. Sorry. <laughs> it was, I as I said, important, but <laughs> the uh, maybe we should have divided um, it could It could have also been scheduled separately. Um, it didn't have to be. Yeah. I, I, I meant for just a minute, you know, a, a few minutes. It got away from me. I apologize. Yeah, and I think we we pushed it. I mean, you know, Wendy had the question, and we pushed and prodded mm -hmm. as you started. Putting Which was important. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't yeah. meant to yeah. happen that yeah. way. So, won't happen. Yeah. <laughs> won't happen that way again. Yeah, but, but it's the detail. I mean, the conversation picked up after that. I think yeah. it did go well overall. That's a, yeah. that's a nit. Um, I was uh, just just a a sort of wish. I wish I'd known. I, I was torn when I showed up and that people were talking about the criticisms that had been posted. I hadn't caught that and, you know, was prepared to talk about the chapter, but was only prepared to listen to the criticisms. And I don't know exactly what we could do about that, but, you know, just to all be on the same page, you know, I felt, I felt unprepared. Um, um, is there a, a place where you would have, so an obvious place for that is the agenda. I, I think we don't have a practice of really checking what the agenda is before we get there mm. yeah, um, I, or, or feeding the agenda. I, I also think there's an agenda item around epistemology too, that we're just going to keep on every book that we look at, we're going to be looking at how we actually um, privilege certain views over others. Um, so I don't know, Marc Antoine, I think, and others would have potentially similar views, we're going to come back to the how do we know what we know question often. And is that a valid way of knowing epistemology is and then that, you know, it's just you can't escape it. Every single book will have um, deep questions around this, no matter which book it is, no matter which artifact you're looking at. And perhaps our big questions will reflect a lot of those and we can make a little efficiency by dealing with those, perhaps in another place. Um, they'll create dust of their own, but you know, at least we can say this much and not that. Listen. I'm headed out to Davis. I'm going to take my shirt. Um, anything else super important? I, I want to make sure we wrap reasonably on time. Um, I I have one actually. Uh, I've uh, I've committed a fault with our retros. Actually, uh, we should have. <laughs> more overhead. We should have examined uh, the retros from last meeting, um, maybe not in this meeting, maybe in a prep meeting for this meeting or something like that. But um, one of the principles of retrospectives, or, or one, of the, one of the failure modes of retrospectives is the facilitator goes, OK, let's do a retro. And then you accumulate a lot of stuff. And then it gets filed and it disappears. So a real retro is for the benefit of the group. It's not for the benefit of the facilitator, making sure that she, he or she's got um, a, a, a book full of stuff. Um, so somehow I would like to fold in digesting and composting the retro from the previous meeting, um, probably before the next meeting. And maybe know. that's an offline thing, not, not in the meeting itself. I don't know if this is a really crazy thought, but um, but the idea of in the off weeks, you know, having, you know, a half hour session to yeah. digest and, and also generate the agenda so that 
people have a week to check the agenda and realize if there's something yeah. else to read or, or whatever, you know, and, yeah. you know, maybe not all of us could make that, but it would leave a little artifact and keep the meeting itself clear for yeah. the discussion. I, I like that as much as I don't like it. I like it. <laughs> what the book people is important. Am, am I unmuted? Yeah, I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would have liked to stay a little closer to the text. Uh, I don't know how to do that and because I also like uh, the texture of the ideas that get stirred up in people. But I think the balance was off for me. Makes sense. I, I've got that feeling too. I, I echo that. And and yet, on the other hand, I wouldn't have given up any of the, the content conversation we had. So I, I, I feel a real tension about time, like there's not enough time. Actually, I think, oh. I have to run, I'm sorry. Hi Klaus, good to see you. I think one of the tensions is, and me personally, I'm always tempted to go to the big picture and the, talking about the book as a whole rather than one chapter. But, and I do want to speak about the one chapter, but it's, um, for me, things make sense in context. And so I'm tempted always to see this one chapter in the broader context of the book as a whole. And uh, this runs off into something too big. And I wonder if we should kind of alternate close readings and yeah. what comes out of the close reading and seeing it in the broader context, but so that we actually devote time to the close reading, because I do agree that this needs to be done also. Mm. Um, I agree. Mark, if on alternate in this meeting or al alternate in Maybe one, one meeting. every other meeting, something like that. I don't know what's the, but, but I think we need time for close readings and we need time for expanding. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Pete, I just want to say one thing when you said, you know, time's always an issue or there's never enough time yeah. to, uh, I've, I've found as a facilitator, if you point people's attention that there's not enough time, they go, oh, there's not enough time. And instead, if we say, we have 90 minutes and within that 90 minutes, we have a lot of ways that we can fill that. And let's sense into what makes the, the most um, uh, sense for us as a group today to make that happen so that we yeah. can, we can, um, you know, we can we can fill the time really productively without having to rush through it. And so I just, I'm always wary when people say there's not enough time because I've told myself that story a lot and I've really been working with it lately to say, you know, there is enough time and, and there's not enough time to do everything, but there's enough time to do what I want. Yeah. Most of what I want. I certainly don't have time to read everything I want to run. <laughs> I want, that's for sure. But just playing Thanks. with time. Thanks, Ken. Doug? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize my hand was still up. I'm done. This one I offer gratitude. I'm so happy to have people to talk to about this book because it's, I mentioned yesterday to a friend of mine, I feel like my brain is getting changing every day. I read this in Sand Talk and a couple other things. I'm like constantly like, oh, that's new and connections. And it's so good to have people to talk with about this. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Michael? Um, just another thought, which which I think was happening in the Mattermost chat without me noticing as much, but if, if in a more formal sense, and maybe it is in that off-week agenda setting, like each of us comes, and maybe this takes the place of the check-in, I don't know, with, with a thing that we'd like to be a discussion issue. Um, so that, and, 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 and possibly have that, you know, Mark Antoine wants to talk about this, Wendy wants to talk about that, you know, other Wendy wants to talk about that, you know, that, that we go into it with the knowledge of having, you know, six or seven points to cover. Um, I, I like that. And I'd like to feed that into um, the, the agenda actually. Yeah, what Wendy just said, let's put that into our um, 
Wendy McLean. Yes, the I really have to <laughs> distinguish between Wendy's here. But yeah, putting that in the check-in of here's what I love to talk about today. It's on my mind. That would be an awesome way to start, I think. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really done check-ins on the two calls I've been part of. So um, yeah. maybe that was a good way to keep our check-ins focused and laser-like. Mm. Right, just just on Wendy's, or just on the um, idea of having this light focus, what I'm noticing in the yarns that um, Dave Snowden and Tyson and other Indigenous thinkers are having is it's actually the intersection between all our influences where the new stuff actually turns up. It's really important um, to, in some ways, just just visit lightly the agenda that you've set and just allow it to do something quite emergent because that's that's really, really important. And, and it's funny when you do this, and I haven't done the text analytics over the four that I've got my hands on, um, but I probably would be one of the few people on the planet who is really close to four yarns involving this type of thinking. And there's actually more in common than you think between them, but it's only if you've looked at those really closely. You know, I've been involved not as, as a creator, as an observer. Um, so something about that um, and not forcing it to be a particular agenda is quite important. Uh, one last question. How did HackMD work for folks? Um, I feel like a, a little fewer people felt like they could participate if they were in, uh, w would you have participated in Google Docs if it wasn't HackMD or is HackMD okay? My personal feeling is that having the, the other media running alongside is a distraction. The, the two panes, you mean? Or uh, running or, in relationship to talking about the book. Uh, so notes in general are distracting from the actual talk. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm an old guy, you know. I, I feel the, the opposite. Um, I, I had a pretty acute feeling um, this time. I can do a better job of taking notes when everybody can see the notes and, mm -hmm. and chip in a little bit and you know watch me as I need to fill something in then they can help. And so um, the notes are less rich than they could have been if we were if I'd been screen sharing it. But but on the flip side of it, we got a little bit more conversation. And Let me say a little more, but to me, it's like listening to music. If you're listening to a symphony and you had other pieces of other music playing alongside, mm -hmm. it would be very distracting. Or, and I or think a conversation, of a conversation in the audience. <laughs> and I think of a conversation as a kind of performance. Mm -hmm. And what's important is not the facts that are in it, but the tone. What's, what's the overall feeling for life? that this text represents. Uh, and, and in an example of the reason I like notes, um, that, that right there, what's the overall feeling for life that this text represents? Because I've got enough tech going on, I can capture that and put that yeah. in the notes. Otherwise it would have just like vanished. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's a tough, it's a tough one for me. Out. I appreciate I appreciate both. I mean, I'm with Doug. I like to, I'm a monofocuser. When I have too many things distracting me, every time a ping comes in, I've got an email. I mean, it derails my focus of concentration. And yet I've really come to appreciate Pete's um, agility at tracking a conversation, going off, getting links, posting them, taking notes. I mean, it's, it's a skill that I simply don't have and I'm grateful that it's there and but today I was more focused on listening than I was on, on um, putting stuff in. Last week I put a bunch of stuff up in the in the or two weeks ago I put a bunch of stuff in. So today I just wasn't I didn't my focus there. Um, so it'll be back and forth for me. And I don't know if that helps you at all. But that's just you know I'm kind of a straddling the the river here. Thanks. Well, I've got to say that that I have a feeling for what everybody thinks about the book except for Pete. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 very true. Yeah, I didn't get to participate. Yeah, um, very true. Uh, I, I, I have a lot of I, it. It's of great value to me that we have uh, artifacts that stay around that you know I'll be able to read 
um, in six months, in a year, two years, yeah. and other people will be able to read. So it, mm -hmm. it's highly valuable for me to mm -hmm. make sure that we capture stuff in a way that is going to be accessible for yeah. you know, now and into the future. Um, I know that comes at a, at a, a big mm -hmm. trade-off um, for being in the moment. Well, so. maybe we could, um, you could say, I would like to contribute now and pass yeah. off the helm to one or three or five other people who would be yeah. willing to take notes on what you're yeah. saying so that you get an opportunity. Because yeah. I, I, know, I know you, Pete, and you obviously mm -hmm. have a lot going on in that head. And I'd <laughs> love to hear how you're you know, responding mm -hmm. to all of everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. Personally, I, I'm pretty good at uh, double or, or triple focusing. So I keep switching back to see where the notes are being taken. And in this call, every, most people were adding notes in the, in the Zoom chat. So that's why I added my notes. Yeah. But I mean, we could just, I mean, if it, if it bothers someone, we could just shut off the chat and, and then at the very end record it. Or, or save it and look at it uh, later. So personally, I'm happy with the double note-taking and I'd certainly uh, agree with what Ken just said. Uh, you're not just the facilitator, you're essential to yeah. creating a, a shared context in, in which we can uh, understand what we think. Yeah. Well, thank I'm you curious. all. Oh. Great call. oh, Michael? No, I was just going to say, I'm just curious if, um, as opposed to when, so we, Google Docs was used last time around. Yep. And did you take the contents of the Google Doc and put it in a HackMD, or did you go directly to, I mean, I, I know this is preferable, I, I, but. I turned them into uh, Markdown, and, and it's not, it, it's hard enough that it's hard enough that it's <laughs> and the, the funny thing is that you know it, it takes me maybe like 20 minutes or something like that to get the the google doc 20 minutes where i don't have to think very much even it's kind of me mechanical but but then getting 20 minutes to do that for two calls from right, you know sure. from a week means that you know it's it's really hard to get that into my schedule so it's like right. okay this was stupid this time <laughs> doing this Google Doc thing, you know, might've made it a little bit easier for other people, but it made it so that it was a lot harder for me to, to get through it. So the hack and bees literally just save and then it's done. But if, you know, it's harder for people to, to participate, then that's well, not good either. What I was going to ask is just whether your participation, you know, you, you carried the most weight in the hack MD in a way that you didn't in the Google Docs. Yeah. Um, and if that taking you out of the experience of the meeting and your contribution verbally to the meeting, just mm. that's where the trade off is there, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I like if, we, if we could do more of the note taking and yeah. that was happening in Google Docs and mm. you were ending up like pulling, I mean, you're still going to have a bunch of stuff in chat here. I, you know, I'm not saying that it's you, but I'm de facto, I'm sure it was you last week. And maybe yep. we have to do something about that in that off week thing we do. Yeah. I, I don't know how, how it gets put together, but just just wondering if given given the other buckets besides HackMD that have to be put into HackMD, if the trade-off is worth it and if it's happening somehow. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a good calculation to go through. Yes. <laughs> I have to admit, I note when Pete says amazing things that the notating stops because he's got to be thinking and processing. So I'm often sad than thinking that is actually recorded, but it's not recorded as text in the way that Pete rev very reverently does it for all of us. So even if it's not um, as eloquent as Pete's summaries of our work, um, even if someone's recording something about what Pete says, it's at least there for the record. And, you know, future Pete can go back and just put that part in as he might have done observing himself, you know, second order cybernetics, etc. <laughs> um, because I, I think um, the value that you bring, Pete, is really extraordinary. And I don't think I feel a little sad that the amazing things that you say, uh, because 
the fluidity that you're applying to other people is not necessarily able to be done as a dual processing thing for yourself. We should just step in and type whatever. <laughs> PK <laughs> needs 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 quick tidy up. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, I think you're you're taking a natural role here, but you're also a, a content contributor. Yeah. Um, and all of us suffer from not being able to know what we think until we see what we say. It's true for every single one of us. Every now and then we'll turn up with something that's just like, oh, wow, that came out of my neurology directly. <laughs> How did I know to say those words? And it's just beautiful when somebody captures that for us. It's such a gift. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I like the fact that you could do it. I'd feel very sad if we put you in a place where you couldn't do that, that the frustration would come through and the quality wouldn't be there. So we should never take you out of your comfort zone. <laughs> we should never a very, interesting a very interesting discussion. And to me, it's the choice between is life to be lived like a museum or like a performance? Yeah. yeah. One of the uh, things about indigenous people is they're very performance oriented. They're in the group and they listen. And that's where the work is done. Uh, nobody's writing it down. And uh, Pete, I, I love watching you play around with the technology and all that stuff. But at the level of conversation, I'm skeptical. <laughs> and who goes back and looks at those notes anyway? Uh, I do. Oh, yeah, I, I do. do. Yeah. I do. I do. <laughs> and, and I'm actually working with cons. I'm working with yeah. um, live transcripts the value that I'm getting from going back and looking at those words. And you can see that where somebody takes something and Dave Snowden's really guilty of this. One of these days I'll take Dave. He's got this thing that he wants to do and it's not respecting the conversation that just took place. I can see him do it. I think Dave, you're breaking rules here in terms of conversations and ideas and listening to other people. And this, there's almost like a zone that people get into it about the 20 minute mark in any transcript in a long form conversation of 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and then there's these big cycles that happen where people get into this sort of synergy and where the exchanges, the ideas and the intersectionality actually really starts to turn up. And then someone closes a loop. It's just real, it's amazing to watch, but you have to go back to the transcript to see it. Um, and you wouldn't see it even in the comments if somebody is observing from the side, I think Pete does do a bit of this. He actually finds the peak of one wave and then loops it back. And he might have missed some of the detail in between. But if somebody else is surfing another wave, that summary will be there somehow. And without the, the transcripts and without what happens is we, move, we lose these um, points where the conversation is diverging or could diverge. And we sometimes don't come back to it. But there's, um, it's like a, it's a melody in some ways, what's not being spoken about and what is being spoken about. And the spatiality of that is really the dynamicism. Doug, I'd love to chat with you more about this because it's actually there. And it's there between the conversations as well. It's probably there between the two sessions in one week as well. Mm. And it's, people are riffing off the other stuff that's happening in their lives at the same time, like the sand talk thing for me and these books, the one that I shared, you know, Becoming Animal is the one I haven't got into. It's like we miss that level of nuance at our cost because it absolutely exists. And everyone's sort of saying something very similar, but we're not catching the wave of what that is. Hey, Tuning um, into it. Uh, Thanks, Wendy. I, uh, there's a lot in there. <laughs> and I like how deep you, um, uh, you can soak into uh, a recorded conversation, essentially a transcript or whatever. And I also, I have, sympathy isn't quite the right word. I have, um, I, I resonate strongly with Doug, uh, you know, um, because uh, I really like a live musical performance and closing your eyes and just soaking it in, you know, just experiencing it and not having to process it intellectually and dissect it and things like that. So I, I, I see value both ways. I have to add this. Um, 
because when did trigger this in my in my brain? It, there was a period uh, when I was working at the World Cafe where um, some of us would just sit in the room and listen to the mm. whole room. And over a period of several uh, cafes doing this, we we discovered that there is a pattern also in sound in a large mm. cafe where during the third round things would take on a completely different oral tone it was much i don't know how to really describe it but it's like okay you know the first two rounds were just kind of we're orienting to each other in the third round now we're really converging on things and we're starting to understand each other deeply and you could actually hear it in the tone of the room we did this with people with, with the cafe with over 500 people it's just it's it's amazing uh so that <laughs> I, I love that idea because that to me is a fractal pattern. It shows up in a in a Zoom call with, with looking at the uh, the transcripts. It shows up in a world cafe with two hundred people or five hundred people, and so I think this is actually a pattern worth paying attention to. I have some experience in experimenting with this, and one of the things that I notice is in a group at about an hour and a half, the fo the the focus of the group shifts from the topic it's being discussed to the group itself to appreciate being in the group it's an emergent phenomenon and very powerful yeah epiphenomena group epiphenomena yeah the, and that is actually um I don't know the per name of the person, Pete, you could probably help me here, but remember the person that um, Kalu's been talking about um, from Ireland? I think that there are people who, and, and there's also a dissonant voice here too, about um, understanding when that sort of, it's singing, it's actually a sound thing. It's a, it's a sound wave pattern. There's a level of sound going on. It's of, often um, the quality of that is actually quite dependent on the speciality of the place that you're in because you've got to be able to hear it and and hear people settle into it so the acoustic qualities of a space for meeting are absolutely important because some people can't even be in that space because of the acoustics and then uh, the attunement that people have is like bird song um, and the the root of language is that we fall into this pattern of exchange which is a bit like singing at each other and um knowing when we can sort of fit in and knowing when we should stand back and let the song sort of go and somebody else's song is more important than our song at that time and then a sort of cut off and a change so anyway there's this guy um there are various people who actually pick that up from an acoustic exchange sound point of view and they look for those exchanges in the patterns across businesses and the patterns within specific conversations within those businesses. And if they can find that quality of exchange there, then the, there's a level of assurance about um, the type of dialogue and where that dialogue is taking people as a community. And they sort of worry less about the actual content, but if the exchange is continuing in the right way, then there's an assumption that emergence is happening and people are in sort of synergy enough and you don't actually have to micromanage the context as much because you know that the conversation has reflected the sorts of things it needed to take. And it's sort of like, you know, a husband and wife dancing around the kitchen, yeah, unstacking yeah, the dishwasher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, we're not going to step on each other because I know where you will yeah. step. And then occasionally we have this, like, I wanted to be in that one spot, but somebody dances yeah. around and it all works. And we do it every time we unstack yeah. the dishwasher. It's like, I didn't know that I knew that you were going to stand there. <laughs> but somehow we negotiated that without words that I wouldn't stand where you, you needed to stand. Or if I needed to, we could look at each other and renegotiate it. And you just map that. It's unspoken and it does exist. And so in some ways, there's something about the mapping of this and the content, while it's as important, is less important than the quality of the exchange. And that if you can find that synergy, you can be less yeah. worried about the content and more. And I think this happened with um, early exchanges around Indigenous people, where people knew they were talking about the same thing, even though they didn't have the words to talk about it. Like, I'm holding something, you're holding something. We both like that thing. I don't have the word for your thing. You don't have the mm -hmm. word for my version of that thing. 
but we're both holding it. We both agree that the conversation is about the thing, the material that we are holding, you know, a bird, food, whatever. And I'm not going to take it out of your hands. You're not going to take it out of my hands. We collectively own that thing and we don't have to name it because it's present in the room. But then take the thing being present in the room out of the conversation. We then need to have language or the material to exchange over because we haven't got the thing in the room. The people, the materiality of this is so, so important. You know, we will argue around the thing food, which means different to you. If we haven't got that thing there and I can take a bite and you can take a bite, that's a form of negotiation. The minute you do that over distance, you're left with the words and you're left with a problem because we can't exchange over the thing. So we have a fight about it like Ukraine. It's just because we don't, we're not coexisting in the same space. We can't have negotiation around it. My words and your words are going to end up in some other fight. Anyway. Yeah, that, that, that's really beautifully said. I, I like that a lot. And just as a side note, I'm very interested in what you said right at the beginning, when the, about the acoustic quality of the place where the conversations take place. If you have any kind of reference to people writing about that, please oh, yes. put it online <laughs> for us. That's really yeah. interesting. I, I, it frustrates me. I, I started out my work um, in experience design in places. Places are the root of words. Okay, yeah. the objects I have in my world, I have. If I I turn that into words from the first moment of my existence, and after that, I'm hung by the words I can use to describe something. And if I am not in the same place as you, I will never be able to. Um, nothing in my whole world will ever make up for the fact that we're not in the same place. Nothing. Yeah. Even different views of the same place are a problem. And then our experience of that place is absolutely essential. We will, we just do not acknowledge this. And it can't be done. You cannot actually go back to that place and our different views of that one place. If, and so everyone keeps on ignoring this. It just the acoustics mar and you know every time you just move around it second order cybernetics again but you know it, the mature version of it you, you can't even stand in the same place that somebody else was in because their view of it is always going to be different to your view of it because you've got a different prehistory mm -hmm. so we're constantly ever you know trying to make up for that and it's almost impossible to do Except for to get into this synergy where it's like I accepted yeah. that you where you were standing and your view of it is different to mine, but we've got this little synergy. I'm not going to take the food out of your mouth if I had a meal yeah. beforehand. And the food's yeah. physically got to be there, or otherwise yeah. I won't understand the importance of what I just said. Yeah. That's where yeah. empathy comes from. I can't know what it's like to be in America. Not at all. <laughs> I can guess. Why would you want to? <laughs> <laughs> I feel very sad in some ways. Like, and I'm I'm surrounded by nature. And when a Chinese student in my own house says she can't see a tree in a rural city, I am just I the gap between us, and we're living in the one house. Yeah. And they're saying in rural China, you only have buildings in a township, and you do not know what a tree is. You've got to look at your phone instead because that's more relevant than the tree. Yeah. It's like, how can you know where food comes from? How can you, like, it's just the gap is enormous. So anyway, the one thing that can connect us is nature. And I'm sorry to be, it's like, and we're losing so much of it that it's almost impossible to connect again because everything's constructed from that one point. Anyway, end you know, of <laughs> I was in I was in Shanghai in 2007, and I had seen this documentary called Shanghai Ghetto, which was about the Jews that escaped um, Europe and ended up in Shanghai. And it's a very wonderful film. And um, this was the year before the 2008 Olympics, so they were in the process of raising the last 12 blocks of what I remembered from that that movie, Shanghai mm -hmm. Ghetto. Those houses were still there. There were there were bulldozers all around them and everywhere were high rises and concrete and I thought to myself imagine if you're a person of 50 60 70 years old and everything you know 
has been plowed mm-hmm. under and cemented over and high rises built, you know, your connection to the land has been severed irrevocably and it must have an amazingly traumatic effect on your soul. I just, I can't imagine yeah. what that is like. I mean, I can, cause I can go back to places that were sacred to me when I was a child that are now, you know, bulldozed up and yeah. cemented over and this it's is- just horrible, horrible. This is happening to millions and millions, a billion people in China are, are suffering this, right? And it's this everyone. Is, it's it's trauma. The, this, is, this is the power of the sand talk, the conversations that I'm listening to that Tyson and Dave Snowden, and everyone, they're talking about how we, we diaspora. So I don't have the right to be an indigenous person, even though my family goes back to Wales, 1088. I can bring the book. I sleep two meters away from a book that shows how my family goes back that far it's not quite a thousand years but it's pretty close to it and that's the written word you know this this person this person this person this is half of my family or a quarter of it anyway i don't have the right to be indigenous at all and yet i see also this counter equation around um an invitation from fellow australians to say we are all australian we are all Australian. And it's almost like it, we're not ceding the land, but we're saying in this time and in this moment, we are all of this continent and of this place. And and when they say that, we can move forwards. The minute somebody says, no, you can't be of this place. I have no connection to anything. I can't be anything except for something historically I'm not allowed to be because I wasn't born in Wales. I can't say I'm Welsh. And so you've got everyone who's moved, and this is pretty much everyone on the planet, if you go right back to DNA and, you know, where, you know, Africa and the whole thing, everyone has shifted. And we're losing the only thing that connects us to the land at all, historically in neurology, which is the environment, the natural environments that we're in. Like, if you have no natural environment, it's the only thing (laughs) that can connect us historically over time with where we came from. And it's just that once you lose that, then you have to renegotiate what an environment is. Is a buildings with one one blade of grass and half a tree? Is that? And you can't do that quickly. It's when we so say we've lifted three billion people out of poverty, we've lifted them into those high rises and ruined their lives. Mm. Yeah, completely. And if you give them one plant, at least there's something you can observe but it's not connected with the other things. You can't observe complexity because you can't, you can't create complexity. It has to emerge and it emerges over time. So we've got all these different systems that are emerging in different places based on accidentally what your high rise looks like and what it sounds like. And it's completely inaccessible unless somebody else lives in another sort of vague version of it. So how can I feel empathetic about something that I don't want to live in? I'm not going to live in one of those buildings. <laughs> Watch me camp under a tree somewhere, feeling much happier. But lots of people can never do that. We can't connect. Mm-hmm. So anyway, there's very huge divides based on just the fact that we're exposed to different environments, and there's almost no overcoming it. I can't understand America. It's just like I can't understand that because I'm not there, <laughs> and it's. Um, it it saddens me a lot and it energizes me a lot. It's like, how can I even get close to that? <laughs> um, anyway, sorry. As the sole Australian in the conversation. No need, no need to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see these plants? I have them here for a reason. They remind <laughs> me. <laughs> anyway, yeah. As much as close as I can get to nature as much of the time as possible. Nice plants, Ken. Yeah, that snake plant was a little, I raised it from a pup and now it's a wild jungle. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I think that's the only thing I can do is just to, to, to really get try and get as close as possible to nature and see what I learn from her as much of the time with other people. And then it just sort of sorts itself out a little bit, just a little bit. Well, and to recreate that. Some people on this call know that I'm a, a big fan of Michael Mead. Um, and Michael talks about the in, in America, there is a pastime that far, you combine all of the sports pastimes, they don't even equal half of the people that engage in this pastime. Do you know what it is? Gardening. Yeah. 
Yeah. And Michael's take on this is gardening is a way to bow and touch the earth because you constantly head. have to put your head below your heart and put your hands into the soil and it connects you to the earth in a very profound way. And um, when I got here, my patio had uh, no no vegetation around it. I, I It was all hard packed clay. And I, there we go. And <laughs> I, um, I don't know if it's whose book this is, but um, this is... Like I said, I think it is pretty much the only way that we can reconnect and, and things, it's just absolutely foundational. I don't know, you know, this book's got lots of different models, but you all have to eat food. And there's and a it, tremendous you know, opportunity to green cities. I mean, there's no, yeah. no reason we cannot create green spaces yes, that are capable of raising food and beauty in the city. It yeah. just takes, you know, we have to, we have to do it. And I'm looking at Doug's painting behind him that he probably painted of um, probably something right out your window, huh, Doug? Yeah, that's the backside of the house on the Russian River. And I turned the screen around to look outside, but it's too bright so we can't see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, I, and this way, you know, we've lost class to this conversation, but, you know, I do agree. It's like, just grow something and then talk about it. Yeah. And, and keep on trying to do that one thing. Where can you put something in your world that is live and um, I've looked at enough of the cybernetic stuff for a job interview the other day. Um, the definition and, and the indigenous stuff, the, the difference between, and this comes back to coding and such, um, something is animated can um, or could be animated, like the difference between steel and wood. So wood, you can have a conversation around um it's aliveness if that makes sense whereas steel is harder to have that conversation around its aliveness but you can't do indigenous thinking unless you could pretend that the animal or the plant actually could talk to you that you could actually listen to the plant or listen to the ant or listen to the tree but can i listen to steel in the same way and it's too removed from where it came from so anyway, I'm, I'm practicing trying to say, what would that thing tell me if I could listen to it and sitting with that question? And that, that then becomes something that has agency. And that's sort of the, the boundary that I'm experimenting with at the moment is that if I listen to an ant, I can watch an ant move around and I can watch a, a leaf die and, and not, if that makes sense. But steel doesn't have that degree of change in it. So this is sort of liminality there around agency and life and animation and animacy. Um, and that's where I'm trying to retune myself to, is to say, if I sat and watched that plant for a while, what would it do? And with time-lapse photography, you can. I'm just not going to do as much of that as perhaps I could. <laughs> but the people who make a lot of learning in these places, they actually do sit and do an awful lot of watching, just watching and listening. And then uh, they do turn into it. Uh, I've just started the sand talk, but I, it, I guess it's in the second chapter. Uh, uh, Tyson says he's not in, he doesn't understand rocks. So he goes to yeah. someone who maybe doesn't understand other things, but knows everything about what rocks have to say in the universe so i think it does have a lot you can't understand everything but you can understand something and talk with people or listen to people deeply who understand yeah. maybe steel maybe steel can talk maybe maybe everything yeah. can talk in its own way i think we actually because we've created so many artificial environments if you look at um, the uk for example I can't say of this of my own place, Australia, but in the UK, you you could reasonably say that that every part of that landform has been stood on and changed over time. In Australia, there are plenty of places you can go to where you could pretend that no one has ever stood there before. I regularly have that experience. Um, so I think that once you've got a lot of artificial environments, you actually have to say, what does this still tell me? And an architect, my dad's an engineer, an architect or an engineer would look at the materiality and they would see differences. And this is where you need to connect to physics 
and you know things like Bohemian dialogue and other yeah. bits and pieces. You know, there's there's definitely um, for materials. I think that we will get to a point where, and AI is one of these things as well, um, where you have to say, what if I sit with this robot? What could this robot tell me about? You know, this time and space. It's going to be different, yeah. but I've got to make the effort to say, what could this other thing, as an intelligent thing, what could still yeah. tell me about my yeah. possibilities now yeah. we because we've gone so far past the point of legitimate animacy if it was a stretch to do it with a rock it's going to be an even bigger stretch to do it with steel but i think we're already doing it yeah we just don't know how to sit with that question and say you know and it's, it's yeah. not a philosophical thing it just isn't, you know, the material, the, the rock and the architects and engineers, they do this all the time. You know, when, when steel, when rock, when wood, what can I do with X? Yeah. We've got to that point. We're going to get really good at asking steel what the steel is telling us. And it's like, yeah. whoa, that's a bit woo woo. But engineers do it all the time. Yeah. There's a terrific book, but it's it's on a different uh, floor in the house where my wife is sleeping at the moment. But it's it's written by a uh, an Indian woman, Hindustani, uh, a woman who was an apprentice architect on some of the beautiful modern skyscrapers in London. And she wrote a book about materials where she goes into all the materials that were used uh, since the, uh, the, at least the Bronze Age to make big buildings. And she writes about them by getting into what that material says about where it came from and what it can do for the world. Uh, I'll yeah. get the reference can you find to it tomorrow and I'll put it online. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And Christopher uh, Alexander's turning up in a lot of things at the moment because he died recently. Um, yeah. And he's talking about um, how can you create places that allow you to feel and you can step in and then there is definitely a dimensionality around yeah. it because you've got to actually force people to be close enough to react to something. And if you let the spaces be too big, they won't have to feel. Anyway, it is yeah. time to go. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I guess so. <laughs> I think we should wrap. <laughs> yeah, the the set last part of this, the last forty five minutes were also really good. So I'm glad you kept the recording on. I uh, did you keep? Yeah, kept the recording on. Terrific stuff. Uh, <laughs> see you in two weeks. <laughs> in two weeks, if not more. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye all. <laughs>